You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. I promise today to do a special message on how to witness to people with too much religion. (laughs) Um, I do have notes for my message, and we will try and make them available on Wednesday in paper form. If you want them in paper form, it's going to cost you $3 because it's... uh, 12 pages, Uh, but you don't have to pay. Uh, If you pay attention to the media team link that they sent to you, it will contain my notes, and uh, you can do it that way, and then you can print it on your own. It probably will be, you know, good for you that way, especially if you have your own printer. So we're going to uh, do it that way. But today, uh, I am not, of course, going to have time to go through everything that is in my notes. There are at least 200 verses that I have introduced to you in different sermon, in different uh, what I would call topical things that you need to know yourself as a Christian before you start talking to other people. So this will be helpful to you if you're talking to Muslims, if you're talking to Buddhists, if you're talking to uh, uh, Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses, whatever, it will help you. And uh, the passages are there. I also borrowed something from a man named Hank Hanegraaff. Uh, He has a radio broadcast where he basically talks about, uh, it it does what I call apologetics, uh, deal with issues that Christians deal with, especially issues in doctrine. So I borrowed a section of his uh, explanation of what the word doctrine stands for. And uh, you will see those also uh, in the notes. But let's get to it this morning. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 17. The book of Acts chapter 17. And we are going to begin with verse 22. When you get the time, you can... uh, Actually, read the whole chapter, chapter 17. And I will encourage you, those of you that saw my invitation on Facebook, I did mention that the message is based on the whole book of Acts. But I'm focusing on chapter 17. Not only that, uh, if you are interested... I will encourage you, if you want to do a short study to support what I'm giving to you today, take some time to read the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and also the Gospel of John. Are we all on the same page? Amen. Uh, Paul's visit to Athens reveals a lot to us about how to deal with people with too much religion. When we get to verse 22, we read the following. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens... I see that in every way you are very religious. 
For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are uh, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Now, let me stop there and just say this. How religious can you be? We have so many gods. Greeks have so many gods. To the point that they say, just in case we miss some. We're going to devote an altar. And that altar is going to be devoted to the gods we don't know. You cannot be more religious than that. <laughs> wow. Very interesting. Two and unknown God. Now, Paul said in verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Please, you need to listen to these verses because Paul is doing something. He's training us how to deal with people with religion. Listen, he started with God. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they will seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. And notice what he just did. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everybody by raising him from the dead. Amen. So let's, let's deal with some definitions as we begin this. What do I mean by religion? Because when we're looking at this, we ought to look at it as Christians. I am proposing to you that religion is not the same as Christianity. Even though Christianity is a religion based on human definition. Are, are we still together? Yes. Amen. I wish I could get some amen too. So what do we mean by religion? What is the difference between religion and Christianity? Religion is reaching out to God by any means. Religion is reaching out to God by any means. Christianity is a relationship 
with God. Christianity is not just confessing that Jesus is Lord. Anybody can do that if they're led by the Spirit. You can definitely acknowledge that Jesus is Lord with your mouth and even believe it in your heart, but you don't really believe it because you don't practice it. Let me give you a quick example. If Jesus were to tell you today, let's just assume it is Jesus. Okay? Don't go to work next week. Just spend time. Don't go to work next week. Just spend time in prayer for the whole week. And trust me, I don't even want you to eat for the whole week. How many of us will become philosophers? <laughs> now, wait a minute. That, that cannot be God. Because he knows I have to go to work. He knows I have to feed my family. He knows if I don't go to work for a week, they're going to fire me. Uh, and I don't think he wants me to be fired because God said a man that doesn't work should not eat. And, you know, I don't understand this. I think, I think it may be the devil messing with me. It's amazing how many of us get PhD in philosophy 101 when it comes to simply obeying our confession that Jesus is Lord. I wish somebody would get what I'm talking about. So when we become Christians, in fact, in the New Testament, they used to call Christians the followers of what? The way. The followers of the way. Not the confessors of the way, but the followers of the way. So then if we're saying today... What do we mean by people with too much religion? I think you, you, I need to define some things and make it clear that we are not exempting anybody. The first group we're talking about are called the evangelicals. How many of you know who evangelicals are? Raise, raise your hand. How many of you know who evangelicals are? Get, Okay. When did evangelicalism begin? Matthew 28, 19, and 20. All right. Okay, let me let me make it simpler. Those we call evangelicals are also called Protestants. Some of you, some of you former Catholics, can you tell us when? Reformation. We started with the Reformation in 1517. You still with me? It was that was when we started breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. with the protest of a man named Martin Luther, who nailed what is normally called the 95 Theses to the wall of the church, dealing with the Catholic practice of indulgences. Are you still with me? So evangelicals are actually grouped under what I call People with 
too much religion. Amen. There are people in our churches today, in the Baptist church, in the Methodist church, in the Lutheran church, in the Church of God in Christ, Church of God, Church of God Indiana, uh, National Baptist, uh, the Southern Baptist, Conservative Baptist, Free Will Baptist. You look, group them all together, they call themselves evangelicals. Evangelicals are supposed to be people who believe in the word and follow the word because that was the protest of Martin Luther. We need to go back to the book of Romans. We need to go back to the Bible instead of following what we call church tradition. That was what started the Protestant movement and in Europe. That's the first group. So, if you are among those people, we call you people with too much religion. So, is there anyone in the church that we cannot witness to? I'm just asking a question. It's not a trick question. So, everybody we see becomes what? A candidate for evangelism. Amen? In our Baptist church, in fact, let me limit it. At Village Baptist Church, there are candidates at Village Baptist Church for evangelism. That's the first group. Evangelicals. The second group are the ones we call non-evangelicals. The Catholic Church and some of the other associates of the Catholic Church, like the Anglican. Anglicans sometimes will con consider themselves evangelicals, but they really did not actually leave the Catholic Church. I want to tell you that if you have a Catholic friend, I'm not saying you should be judging them. You should also see them as possible candidates for evangelism. You guys didn't know I used to be Catholic, did you? You knew that, right? In fact, my name, Emmanuel, was given to me at my baptism in the Catholic Church. Before I knew anything, Dick and Allen. And I know a lot of people, especially in the Republic of Benin, who claim to be Catholic. But I've never seen inside of the church except at a wedding or a funeral. I'm not making this up. And if you tell them they're not Catholics, they will die. I've usually, I, I watch people, you know, I used to live on... Uh, Stewart Drive. And I had a neighbor that will roll on the floor and flip and scream if you tell him he is not Catholic. And I've never seen the rosary in his hand, ever. I don't even see it in his car. You know, some people put it in their car. And I asked him one day, who is Jesus? 
I don't want to discuss. Yes. What is my point here? My point is just associating yourself with a group does not make you a follower of Jesus. It, just, it does not make you a follower of the way. When you die and you go to heaven or you die and you go wherever you're going to go, Nobody will ask you, were you a member of Village Baptist Church? Nobody. You're not going to be asked, were you a member of the St. Ignatius uh, Catholic Church? No. That's never a question that's going to be asked. You will not be asked about your denomination. You will not be asked about your church affiliation. You are not going to be asked whether you went to that church once every year. Well, or at least that you are a CME member of that church. Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. That's the second group. When we talk about people with too much religion, I tell you, I have experiences with so many people. Uh, I know we have some online right now. Some of them may be the people I have experience with, you know, and they may be using my name in vain right now. We talk about evangelicals, then we talk about non-evangelicals, then we talk about the sects of Christianity. That's another set. The Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, a.k.a. Mormons. Are you still with me? Some even call themselves Christian science. Some say we are Jehovah Witnesses. The bad thing about this group, this set, is that they have some things common with Christianity. They have some things common with non evangelicals, and they have something common with evangelicals, and it confuses people, and you think that we are the same. I don't believe in the Jesus of Christian science. I don't believe in the Jesus of Jehovah Witnesses. I don't believe in the Jesus that Mormons believe. Don't Kid yourself. Not only that, I don't use the same Bible they use. They call it the Holy Bible, but they have done something very unique to it. All of them. And then we have the last group of people with too much religion. We have Muslims. It's really interesting. Muslims borrowed from the Bible. In fact, Muhammad, even though he said this was given to him and it just, you know, came from across it. Everybody knew he borrowed from the Old Testament. He borrowed from the New Testament. And we are Buddhists. Even though our faith is called the Judeo-Christian faith because of the fact that there is a connection with the Old Testament, but our faith is not the same as Judaism. 
we are diametrically opposed to the confession of Judaism. And then when you come to Marin County, we have the sun worshipers. And we have the pantheists. God is in everything. Too much religion. So you see, Paul is telling us that there is nobody that you meet that doesn't have the potential of being labeled as somebody with too much religion. So we should be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ and preach it wherever we are in the church and outside the church in our community and even when we travel abroad. Don't expect you when you bake a shoe in France. <laughs> Stop everybody that says, uh, do you know who Jesus is? But the point I'm trying to make here is it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you're with. It doesn't matter whether they're your family or they're just people you just met or they're your neighbors or their co-workers. Everyone that you meet is a good candidate for evangelism. So we see Paul's approach here in... Uh, Chapter 17, people of Athens were religious people. In fact, classical Athens was a powerful city-state. It was a center for the arts. Dr. Carpenter it was also the center for philosophy. There you find Plato. There you find Aristotle. In fact, Plato's Academy is in there, and Aristotle's Lyceum was located there. It is word, widely referred to as the cradle of Western civilization and democratic principles. That was where democracy was born. But Athens was also very unique for one thing. They were very, very, very religious. It's amazing how all these philosophers will worship anything, whether it moves or not. It's very sophisticated. How many of you paid attention to the short clip we watched today about witnessing to that Muslim. Did you notice, let, let me put it as a test to you. What did you notice in the dialogue between the evangelist and the Muslim? What did you notice? Yes. Because of the culture. Okay. Thank you. What else? Yes. Always putting the blame on somebody else. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, let me see this. Um, I want you to focus on the evangelist. Focus on the evangelist. It's, it's just a teaching moment. Yeah, yes. Okay, the evangelist? The Muslim. Okay, I want to focus on the evangelist. Yes, uh, Shalina. Shalina. 
Okay, how did he bring it back to the Bible? That's, that's what I want you to focus on. Because that, that makes my first point I want to teach you today. Yes? What did he say about the Ten Commandments that, that, that got your attention? Yes? Amen. Did you, did you get that? It doesn't matter who you're talking to. The first principle of witness to somebody that's got too much religion is find something that you believe you have in common with them. Find the common ground. Find the point of contact. This person cannot deny this. You believe in Moses. As a prophet of God, you believe in the laws of Moses. I'm using that right now to discuss with you. Even when he brought Jesus in, did you notice anything? Yes? A prophet. Why did he call Jesus a prophet? Because that's what Muslims believe. A point of contact. If you want somebody to listen to you, don't just tell them they're dumb. Don't tell them they don't know what they're doing because sometimes they believe the same thing you believe. He will say the thing, you know, that you believe. Moses, that you believe. Jesus, that you believe was a prophet. So you can say, well, don't tell me what Jesus said because Muhammad mentioned Jesus. In fact, not only that, how many of you have ever read the Quran? Thank you. Thank you. I grew up in Nigeria and probably 50 to 60% of my friends were Muslims. The people that I grew up with, the people that I played soccer with, the people that I ate with, the people that I went to school with, they were Muslims, so I learned from them. But not only that, when I went to seminary, when I went to college, I started reading the Quran myself. So it's extremely important if we're going to reach the world, if we're going to reach people that are different from us, we should learn a little bit about what they believe. There's nothing wrong with that. The reason why many of us cannot talk to Jehovah's Witnesses is we may become Jehovah's Witnesses while they're talking to us. Amen. <laughs> we always have to try to create a point of contact. And even if you don't have a point of contact and you know a little bit about that religion, ask them questions. There's nothing wrong in learning from somebody else. Amen. By the way, I heard that you guys fast during the month of Ramadan. Can you tell me a little bit about that? How many people here know what, when the month of Ramadan is? Okay, okay, maybe about two or three. Okay. How many of us here know what the book, the Buddhists use as their guide? Are you getting my point? On last Wednesday of the month when we had our uh, game here, I put NWT on a piece of paper, and when you get it, you're supposed to describe it. 
Nobody that God had knew what he stood for. Uh, what was that? <laughs> okay. Are you getting my point? God is expecting you, if you're going to be his representative, to know when you go into a country as an ambassador, because that's what we are. For you are ambassadors for Christ. As an ambassador, you ought to have a portfolio. You ought to know about the country God is sending you to. Be prepared. In fact, one of the things that they do in the Southern Baptist Church is that if you are going to be a missionary in Nigeria, you don't have to learn English. But if you're going to the north or you're going to the east or you're going to the west, depending on where you're going, they expect you to learn a little bit about that language. Amen. You cannot go to a country that does not speak English and you don't even know how to say good morning. Good evening. Thank you. Good to see you. Americans think everybody should speak English. There are more than 7,000 languages in the world. And the English speaking people are part of the minority. God is good. Amen. Notice what Paul did here. The first thing is to find a point of contact and to hold on to it and begin a meaningful discussion, dialogue, thank you. A meaningful dialogue with a person. The second thing is this. Don't let the devil fool you. Focus on Jesus. Amen. Amen. Paul stood up in the meeting. People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. You don't even know the God. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Listen. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands. And if he needed anything, rather, he himself gives everyone life and bread and everything in it. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they will seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Today, usually when I preach at funerals, I always give the gospel. And they all look at me like it's uh, Wednesday. Amen. I don't care who is in front of me. I'm going to give you the four points of the gospel. If the person that we're funeralizing is a Christian, I know without a doubt that there are going to be some people in there who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Focus on Jesus. Now, let, let, me, let me go back to Paul. 
Paul said, therefore, since we're God's offering, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image made by human hands and design scale. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now, listen to this. He commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by what? The man he what? Has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by, just in case you missed the man he was talking about. By doing what? Raising him from the dead. Who was raised from the dead? Jesus. Everybody else got resuscitated. Everybody else got resuscitated. They, even when Jesus performed a miracle on somebody and they raised them, it's not resurrection, it's a resuscitation because they died again. Resurrection is different. Only one man in the entire world has ever been resurrected. Focus on him. When he and his disciples were on the island of Caesarea Philippi in Matthew, as recorded for us in Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13, Jesus asked them, who do men say I am? It's very important. You need to know who I am. You need to know who Jesus is. Because you stand or fall based on your view of Jesus. Who do men say I am? Some say you're this. Some say you're that. Some say you're this. Some say you're a good teacher. Some say this. But who do you say I am? You see, who Jesus is, is a personal question. It's directed to you to answer that question. Long time ago, and I never forget it, I've quoted him several times. I was in class with J.I. Parker, one of the most distinguished theologians of our time. I was taking Colossians, the book of Colossians, in his class. And he said, who is Jesus? And everybody in the class, we're all Christians. We are students of the Bible. We all want to be teachers and preachers in the church. Well, you ask such a ridiculous question. Who is Jesus? And he said, that is a test question that will try your state and your scheme. You cannot do well in the rest unless you do well in this. You can know all the ecclesiology you want to know. You can know all the bibliology you want to know. You can know all the eschatology you want to know. But if you don't know the soteriology and Christology question, you have failed. Did I lose anybody? That is the point. Of evangelism. That is the point of presenting the gospel. It doesn't matter who you are with. Jehovah Witness, Mormons, uh, uh, Catholics, Baptists, Methodists, or somebody that just said, I am a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're not going to be mad if I ask you who Jesus is. What's getting you all upset? All I just ask you, who is Don't be afraid because that's what it's all about. It's about Jesus. Amen. I don't know if Frida wrote this, but they used to sing a song at Village during Easter. They say, it's not about Easter eggs. It's not about Easter bunny. It's about what? Jesus is alive. They didn't think I was listening. (laughs) 
Third point. I have five minutes. You can give me that five minutes I have. Third point. Christianity is a relationship and not a religion. Amen. Amen. Christianity is a relationship. If thou shalt confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? You'll be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is what? The gift of God. So no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Christianity is about walking in him. It's not just about confessing Christ. Amen. Yeah, I confessed Christ 10 years ago. And that was the last time you came to church? That was the last time you did a devotion? That was the last time you opened the Bible? Some of us, our Christian birth certificate is still in our Bible. We haven't seen it since we confessed Christ. Amen. How ridiculous will it be if you went for a job interview and they took you in and they gave you a good salary and you attended your work the first week and you stopped going? Uh, what happened? Oh, I was thinking about the work at home. It's really amazing. Oh, Lord, I don't even know how, why God allowed this pandemic. Because the pandemic has destroyed the church. Some of us now think the best way to go to church is through Zoom. I hated the Zoom. Especially when Dick and Roy comes in. Can you hear <laughs> don't, don't get me for that. If any man is in Christ, he is in a new relationship. That relationship is called in Christ. You are new in Christ. You walk in Christ. You live in Christ. You die in Christ. In Christ. Last but not the least. Don't argue. You know, God loves you so much. If you want to go to hell, he'll let you. Why you want to fight for something that doesn't belong to you? Why you want to argue and make bad friendship? Or is that something called bad friendship? <laughs> you know, make enemies. Because you just want to push something to somebody. If they don't want it, keep going. Jesus said, shake off. Amen. It's better. In fact, leave it with them. And go buy another one. Don't argue with a person and say, God didn't create me. Okay. Who created you? Bang. No, if, if you're a monkey, I'm not going to argue with you. Be a monkey that developed into a human being. Why 
why you want to argue with somebody who tell you they were monkeys? Let them be monkeys. And just go and say, you were created in the image of God. And leave it alone. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the living water. Jesus is the living bread. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Just say it and shut up. All you are is a messenger. I have one more minute. All you are is a messenger. You are not a debater. When you're presenting the gospel, just say it. Say it with prayer. Say it with sincerity. Say it with love. And let it go. Amen. 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 I remember when I was trying to hook up with this lady here. <laughs> I, I don't know all the ideas she had about me. She didn't know how many times I've seen that black uh, Mustang go by in Marin City and I, you know, I look and She's fine. <laughs> it took somebody else to arrange a swimming party for us to meet. And she gave this short African a chance. But I asked, I can't even remember what restaurant, I think it was a Chinese restaurant we went to. Will you go out to eat with me? Amen. Can you, can you just imagine if she said no? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I, do you know I'm a preacher? <laughs> do you know that my father is a chief in Africa? <laughs> How can you say no to me? I am handsome. May not be tall. <laughs> I know your father. We go to the same seminary. You can't say no. That would be ridiculous for you to say no. Who gives you the right to say no? <laughs> Amen. Before Dick and Roy takes my shoes. <laughs> here on Wednesday just go having a good time discussing what it means to let the Holy Spirit do his job. Whatever you do as a Christian, don't present morality. Because you're defeating the purpose. How many of you here have never done anything wrong? In fact, last week. Oh, 
Okay. Amen. If the gospel is based on being morally pure, we are all going to hell. And I'll be there first. With my shoes on. <laughs> but thank God that the gospel is by grace alone. For by grace are you saved through faith. Present the gospel and let it go. Let's close our eyes for a second. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.